Commission Factory. In the market for a new couch, what is it that influences your purchase? Is it the design? How about the material used? Is sustainability a factor for you or is comfort more important? What about the delivery? Does it need to be Australian made? Turns out there's a lot that goes into making a decision to buy a couch, as my next guest will attest. Sam Viney is the CEO of Lounge Lovers. The company was founded by Derek Kerr with the mission to give customers access to great looking furniture at exceptional value. Initially launching as an online-only store, the demand to touch and test lounge lovers' high-quality, affordable items fast increased, and to meet the needs of its customers, lounge lovers opened eight stores across New South Wales, Vic, Queensland and SA. Sam was brought onto the business two years ago to take this fast-growing startup and transform it into the omnichannel business it is today. Having worked for various retail companies, including the powerhouse Aldi brand, Sam was surprised to find that the world of lounge shopping was a little different to what he was expecting. Listen on to find out more. Sam, thanks for joining us today. Thank you. It's exciting to be here and the first time I've ever been on a podcast, so apologies if I'm terrible. I'm excited to be the first. You're going to be excellent and don't worry, it's all edited. It's not live. Perfect. So, uh, Am I allowed to swear? You're allowed to say whatever pops into your head. Excellent. Great. There's some recent news. Can I say congratulations? You can say congratulations. New, newly appointed CEO of Lounge Lovers. Very exciting. Yeah, look, it's exciting. It's been quite the journey there. I've been there two and a half years, but it feels, feels like 10 years at least. Uh, yep. And yeah, it's just been great to take it to the next level of our growth. Lots to talk about in terms of the success of Lounge Lovers, the story, how you guys are going from a marketing perspective. But why don't we first start off with maybe a bit of an introduction to yourself, introduce yourself to the listeners and where you've come from. And- yeah, sure. I'm Sam Viney and I'm the CEO of Lounge Lovers now. Interesting background for somebody finding themselves running a retailer. I actually started in the creative advertising world way back in the early 2000s when it was all about uh, TV ads and press ads and magazines and all that sort of stuff. Makes me sound really old. So worked across a multitude of different accounts in my time in the ad sector, stumbled across a little brand called Aldi. Just a tiny little one. Actually, it was a lot smaller back then. I was at BMF, the ad agency, and started working on the Aldi account in 2008. You were very small then. Yeah, it was about, I hope back then would have been just over 100 stores, and I think they're about 600 now. So yep. yeah, very different time, very different place. But absolutely loved the world of retail, mm. particularly at that stage, the supermarket category. It's a category that everybody's involved in every day, really. Yeah. And it was great working with a, a brand like Aldi, which has a different point of difference in the market. Everyone knows Coles and Woolworths and it's the default for everybody. What a time to be working for Aldi as well when, you know, you've had that monopoly, not a monopoly, I should say a duopoly for so long and in comes Aldi, I remember. What a shake-up. Yeah, thing. look, it was great. Really interesting to really believe in the mission of a brand and what it was doing for not just Aldi shoppers, truth be told, it was actually the wider supermarket category because Coles and Woolworths had to ultimately respond to this new entrant from overseas. And from a marketing and advertising perspective, it was super cool. I found myself at Amart Furniture, spent about a year there. COVID hit and threw everything into sort of chaos for want of better expression. And we started off that period thinking that it was the end of times as far as retail went and that the, the world was ending. Um, and oddly enough, the exact opposite mm. happened. Sales shot up through the roof yeah. for, for retails, particularly furniture retail. Yeah. I mean, that was the time where I made the move back to Sydney over to Lounge Lovers. And, um, and yeah, I tell you what, it was uh, like riding a rocket ship at times as far as just the amount of change and the growth in the business and some of the challenges that you go through. COVID was a weird experience for everybody, but anyone who worked in furniture retail saw everything. Yeah, it's that classic thing, isn't it? Yeah, we've had a lot of retailers on the show. Things that you say are very similar to what mm. they say, but COVID just killed it for them in yep. a good way. I say that in a good way, in a yes. positive way, not a bad way. Um, in terms of, you know, everybody just thought this would be the end for so many other brands. Sadly, it was. I was working in a publisher house at the time and That was a really devastating time. A lot of people let go and yet you see the retailers who just 
it was phenomenal for them, but mainly for the ones that were able to pivot. There were many that didn't pivot fast enough. Firstly, I agree. It, it was incredibly disruptive for retailers. I think what worked in our favour and the brands that did well were the ones who genuinely had their e-commerce ducks sorted out yes. before it all hit versus a lot of other brands who were furiously trying to make up for 10 years of non-investment in anything digital and trying to do it all in the space of six months and obviously that's an impossibility. But so you join Lounge Lovers right in the midst of, of yes, yeah, right, the C word. Right in the midst of all of that, yes. Um, so why don't you maybe share with the listeners a little bit about the Lounge Lovers story and sure. how you came to be there. Yeah, look, Lounge Lovers was started by the founder, Derek Kerr, about 11 years ago. And Derek was working in the UK and he was working in private equity at the time. And he realised that Australians were fairly hard done by as far as the furniture market went. It was dominated by some legacy players who stole very vanilla sort of furniture, not particularly stylish or anything like that. And if you wanted the cool stuff, it was available, but you had to pay an awful lot of money. He came back from the UK with a view of starting a business to sort of make stylish furniture accessible to everybody, mm. to the the common person, if you will. Um, and the business went through a few iterations. It started off as digital only, which lasted for a while, but then opened up a showroom and saw how well those two, sort of two things work together. You kind of can't be a furniture store exclusively online, right? For for the mid price. Yeah, look, I, I, I'd, I'd I'd share your view on that, except probably ten years ago. Te- I would well, Temple and Webster is a classic case yeah, where you te- can te- be, but yeah, yeah. Temple and Webster, Mockins and Newey are always all doing fairly well. Yeah, but certainly. I think for a lot of people, they want to be able to see something in the flesh. Sit and... in the chair. Yeah, exactly. It's a I couch just... is an ex- – it's like a TV. You kind of – like same as JB Hi. I kind of want to see what the colour looks like. Yeah. I want to go in store and have a look. I might still yeah. buy online, but I want to sit in the chair and see how comfortable that's it is. That's it. The two, look, the two things, there's no question, the, the digital experience and the bricks and mortar experience, they are incredibly interconnected. And that's an area that we have spent – a lot of time, resources and money, understanding the interplay between those two things. That understanding is never perfect, but certainly I think we're in a fairly good space there. We started off with one showroom. For context, pre-COVID, the numbers of team members were sitting around 30 or 40. We're up over 200 now. Uh, We've got nine showrooms across Queensland, New South Wales, Victoria and South Australia. And look, our ambition is to have more, just so more people around the country can access us as a as a brand. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, you joined uh, a couple of years ago, obviously off the back of an interesting time where lots of brands were pivoting. What was going on at the time? I was brought in to look after marketing and e-commerce. To be honest, though, I, I think the, the greatest benefit of having somebody who'd come from a big retailer, Aldi and Amart, and particularly Aldi, is understanding of processes and how a large organisation works in a really efficient manner, um, as you can, you know, perhaps expect. Um, we were growing so quickly that we'd outgrown our processes, outgrown our systems, um, and, and to a certain degree, started to pop at the seams a little bit. So it was really a, a playing catch up with getting these things in place so that we operated efficiently internally, but more importantly. Our customers had a great experience. When your processes and systems aren't working effectively, it's very hard to give them the experience that you want to give them. Happy to say that it's worked. Our NPS is sitting up around 70, which in the furniture market is pretty unheard of. What's the average? Oh, look, you see all sorts of things. Anything over 60 is world class. Uh, I'm not privy to other retailers, but I think <laughs> during COVID in particular, you would have had Plenty sitting at sub zero just because customers get tired of delays and it's all that sort of disaster. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, so a lot of my time when I first landed was just getting the machine working a bit better than what it had been, making sure we had the right people and the right roles, the right skill sets available to make sure that sort of our growth could continue and not collapse in on itself, which which often happens when you're making that sort of 
uh, journey from a, a founder run startup yeah. into a, a more mature business. Now, I, I'm not suggesting we're a mature business. We're far from it. Um, I've, I've talked to us about us previously being an awkward adolescent, um, <laughs> you know, a, a teenager where, okay, we're no longer this toddler running around just crazy, but it's by no means are we about that maturity. We're still very much on that journey. And I'd say we've got another five years of that at least. Mm. And so what were some of the big things? Look, it's not a sexy part of the organisation, but warehousing and logistics in furniture mm. is incredibly important to your customer experience. If you can't find the products that – and I, I, just for context, warehouses in furniture are huge things. They're massive. Mm. It's – I can imagine. You're talking – football fields yeah. or larger, stacked up to the rafters. So if you don't know where various products are um, or if you don't know how many are there, if you grab the light grey instead of the dark grey and put it in a truck and deliver it to somebody's house, they're also going to have a crappy experience. So one of the first things that we tackled is making sure we put the right systems in place so it's all automated picking, not the sexy part of the industry, but our team basically is told where to go, what to grab, boom, you scan a barcode and basically you can't really you can't do get the it wrong, wrong thing. Yeah. yeah. So that was a big part of improving our customer experience. Joining up our communications from a customer service perspective was crucial as well. It just wasn't quite as perfect as it should have been. Once again, reflecting a business that grew really quickly. Uh, that's always the case of a startup, a little too fast and the systems Correct. aren't always... You add on things. Correct, correct. <laughs> Without connecting the dots between the things you already have and the thing that you're implementing. Correct. Yeah. We've got that running really well. The final piece was understanding how our marketing investment was working. Yep. We are aggressive in our marketing and we had a certain confidence level about what the various channels were returning. But as always with any form of sort of attribution model or ROI modeling, you'll occasionally get this outlier result which causes you all to stop and pause and go, hold on, is this working as well as what we think it is? Mm. Or have we used a methodology that perhaps overstates this or understates it? So we spent a lot of time modeling it different ways and what we've got is a pretty, pretty confident view on what our various channels are returning to us, always using... Historical data, which historical data in the context of a very rapidly changing external environment, you can't rely on the specific dollar number. So attribution modelling is it's generally a little eye-opening. It absolutely is. And I've done it at almost every organisation I've been part of. And it is, it's is—it's always something that surprises you. And in the context more of a startup brand like us, more of a niche brand, certainly some of our digital marketing perform better than what I'd be anticipating. That's not to say it's better than traditional. I don't think that's a blank, blanket statement I couldn't quite make, but certainly it, it opened my eyes. Mm. And so what were some of the things once you undertook that exercise that surprised you? I, I've got a history in big brands, big brands, big budgets, mass reach to an audience that's always in market. And quite frankly, when you're talking supermarkets, it's very hard to segment supermarkets too much. Mm. You know, everybody needs food. Um, mm -hmm. And Aldi was a market that almost self-selected to mm. a certain degree. Yeah. But I think what spun me out a little bit when I came into Lounge Lovers, so we invest heavily in things like performance media. And traditional textbook thinking, or at least my interpretation of it, it might be wrong. That's all about conversion. Performance media is about conversion. It's down the bottom of the funnel and you've already, you need an audience that's already aware of you and yada, yada, yada. And I came into it and with my old school hat on, thinking that way. And what I actually realised is how much now, thanks to the, the likes of Google and Facebook, performance media actually spins that on its head. Is You can actually drive awareness and consideration through performance media. Correct, yeah. Um, which, yep. you know, to a lot of people, I'm tipping their sitting there going, that's really obvious. But if you haven't been in that world, certainly if you've been sitting in a traditional media role for a very long time, and I, I just don't know if we should be talking traditional media anymore. Yeah, yeah true, Because digital is, is, <laughs> is traditional media now. Like there's a whole world of new media Correct. coming in that's, Correct. you know, the new new media. Yeah. But um, if you've been in that world for a very long time, it's hard for you to understand that performance can drive brand and brand can drive performance. Both can do equally the same thing. Correct. And and that's that's been really, really useful for us. One of the strengths of our business, we've got a really clear view of who our 
shopper is. And that has a lot of advantages. That's got advantages in terms of ranging decisions, um, you know, what, what, what fits within our range and what doesn't fit within our range. Which in the furniture category, there is the tendency to want to be everything to everyone. You know, if you go into a traditional furniture retailer, one of the larger ones that have been around for a while, you'll find everything from a couch for 200 bucks through to $10,000 plus, mm. which I think that's the very definition of trying to be everything to everyone. And once you reach a certain size, you need to serve a fairly broad range Large of segments. Audience, yeah. um, but for us in the size we're at, it means we can be quite targeted. And I'm sure if I went up and down Martin Place today asking people, how much would you pay for a sofa? Probably here, lots of two or $3,000. And mm. we're okay, that's normal. Yeah. Actually, when you ask across the breadth of Australia, and I've done this, the number's $1,200. Mm. So if we're out there paying for audiences that reach a whole heap of people who think $1,200 is the maximum that they pay for a sofa or what they see as being the fair value of a sofa with the way our range goes. Yes, we've got some sofas for $1,200, but the average is sit about two and a half. We've got a whole heap of people who just, quite frankly, will never shop with us. It's also a bad brand experience, I think, if you're if you're trying to target that consumer because you think you have one or two products that meet their needs, exactly. but then they fall in love with another sofa and then they're like, it's too expensive for me and that's yeah. disappointing. Yeah. So, you know, you always forget that too. If you're, if you're marketing to somebody who isn't quite your customer set, yeah. they might actually have a bad experience because they feel bad <laughs> that they can't buy the things Correct. they want. There's nothing worse than finding yourself, and I think we've all been there, finding yourself in a retailer where... You walk around and you flip around the oh, ticket. Oh, so embarrassing. And you see it in yeah, those places where if you've got to ask how much it costs, you probably can't afford it. The Flex Your Hustle podcast is made possible by the team at Commission Factory. Commission Factory is the largest performance and partner marketing network in Asia Pacific, powering tens of thousands of meaningful and scalable partnerships. If you're listening to this show, you might be looking for ways to find and activate successful connections that drive revenue for your business. Well, Commission Factory works with everyone from e-commerce brands to influencers, big digital editorial titles and cashback communities, right through to the latest apps and software that help customers convert and they aggregate all those partnerships in the one place. You'll love how easy that makes managing it. If you're tired of paying for clicks and impressions, Commission Factory is a pay-on-performance marketing platform where you pay only when tangible sales are generated, not just eyes on the page, so it's low risk and easy to manage your bottom line. So to all you digital publishers, influencers, online retailer and marketing agency folks out there, come see what Commission Factory can do for you. Visit commissionfactory.com where infinite partnerships are simply enabled. When we chatted the other week, you said something that I thought was really interesting around the customer journey mm. and how the customer journey for buying a lounge or any sort of furniture is very different. You know, it's it's still needs-based, but mm -hmm. it's not always brand-driven. Correct. And so how do you tackle that when you know that, you know, brand is important? Yep. But brand isn't the only thing or the essential thing in the customer journey. Yeah. So, look, firstly, in the furniture category, there's very few strong brands that I'd say that most people would recognize. But the furniture market is really fragmented. I don't, couldn't think of too many more markets that are as fragmented as what furniture is, mm -hmm. particularly for its given size. So as a reasonably unknown player, we've got to give people the confidence to make a purchase from us. Mm -hmm. And a purchase that is a very meaningful amount of money, it's an amount of money that we'll never take for granted. And Coming into the furniture category and a smaller player, the tangible parts of brand is far more important than brand as me as an advertising guy thought about it. Traditionally, you go, okay, brand is a big, expensive TV ad that you then pay lots of money and run everywhere. But the reality is in a furniture, category like furniture, a customer encounters you on Google Shopping, for instance. They've typed in, I want to buy a mid-century leather brown sofa. So those results pop up and they see lounge lovers. Never heard of us, but the product looks really good and the price is really attractive. They click on it. You know, the experience that gives them the confidence is, A, is the digital experience, is the website something that gives me, you know, does it feel like a proper brand? Does it mm. reflect quality? I think we've all had those experiences where you find a product that looks like it's going to be really good value. You get to the website and you're like, is this a scam website? This mm -hmm. feels a bit too rough and ready and a bit too good to be true. 
So making sure that the digital experience feels like your brand, premium, high quality, stylish, all the things that we pride ourselves on. And then knowing the interplay between our digital experience and bricks and mortar, knowing that quite frankly, most people, if they're spending two and a half thousand dollars on a sofa, they're going to head into one of our showrooms and check it out. That's where you're really going to land perceptions of what your brand stands for and how does this represent good value and will the customer ultimately go through and purchase it? I'm really proud of our showrooms. I think we've got a really unique aesthetic. If you haven't been into any of I haven't. Okay, well, I'm going to have to go for a visit. Look, specialise in taking the ugly duckling spaces. So often they're ex-industrial spaces, or warehouses and, and making them cool. Yep. So we do that. It works really well with our furniture range. Nice. Um, you know, I always love you know, running focus groups in showrooms and sort of you let people wander around for the first 15 minutes just looking at things. And even for those who have never heard from you, they're like, oh, this is great. This all feels very much like me. It's This is all being chosen for me. So, so you know, how, how, how appealing is your, your, your range in the flesh? You know, people touch it and feel it. And then finally, the other really crucial element is what's the service like? Mm. We spend a lot of time refining our approach to service. We have a layer of expertise. So a lot of our team are ex-interior designers, or architects and all that sort of thing. So they know what they're talking about. And you get two groups of people who come in. You get mm. some who know exactly what they want. They've got a passion They've for They've researched. They've, They've been on Pinterest. All, oh, they're all over Instagram. Yep. Yeah. yeah. They know exactly and they just make a beeline for the product and here's my card. Yeah. Take it. But then you get people who, and I certainly fall into this category, where you kind of know what you want to achieve, but you don't know how to get there. So mm. having somebody to sort of hold your hand and walk you through that's really, really um, useful. We're not an intimidating place. We're really friendly. Furniture, particularly once you get into the more stylish stuff, has a bit of a tendency to be a quite an intimidating experience mm. if you're not confident in what you're doing. So we're really conscious of that. And that's so true. The fact that you picked that up and you went, you know, this is actually a problem and customers don't like that. But yep. yeah, it's so true. It's, it's, you walk into the more expensive places, they can sniff you correct. and you just don't get treated nicely. It's like going into retailers in Paris. Yeah. You always feel like you're the least cool person in the entire city and everyone's judging you. So we do everything we can to make it a casual, friendly, open experience. That's just uh, such a nice um thing that you've adopted that just really understands yeah. the audience. We've got a really strong culture uh, where you know, everyone's very, very unique, but there are certain things that sort of hold us all together. And one of it is just, yeah, just being really customer focused, but um, down to earth, not, yeah, not intentionally over slick, if that makes sense, yeah. and not pushy. We don't want to be one of those places where you walk in and someone makes a beeline over to you and then latches onto you for the entire time you're in the showroom mm. because they want to get the sale and make the commission. But very much not like that. That's really nice. I mean, I guess every lounge, obviously there's varying types of furniture to buy at varying price points. But a lounge, for instance, is something that you upgrade. Yeah. Every time you buy, you spend a little bit more yep. and you get a bit of a better brand. And so if they're coming to you, they're upgrading a bit. Yes, yeah. correct. And so it can be, to your point, quite intimidating. It, that's exactly And it. a little nerve-wracking. I haven't spent this much on a couch before. It sounds like there's a lot of complexities mm. to that customer buying journey. Yeah. I know you really have been working with Commission Factory and the team from the affiliate marketing space, traditionally seen as a very heavy performance-driven conversion. How do you activate from an affiliate marketing space knowing that there are so many complexities around the yeah, journey? Okay. It's, so firstly, quick shout out to Hannah, who's our performance media lead in the business. She was the one who brought the whole concept of affiliate marketing to the table. Yep. To myself and Derek, who was the CEO at the time. It was something we'd never really considered. Mm. Um, it was completely new to me. It sounded a bit scary at first, particularly when you're talking sort of cash back offers and all those sorts of things. Once again, going back to the discussion between the tension between sort of short-term sales driving activity and long-term brand activity. Mm. But, you know, the, the data's there. Uh, it shows that when you're talking our target audience, people are doing – people look out for these – promotions and opportunities. We really go down two paths. One, I'd call our always on approach, which is very much about getting ourselves in amongst affiliate editorial content that quite frankly, people who are in the furniture market, I'm looking for a couch, so I'm gonna research it online, I'm gonna find some editorial content that tells me more stuff. And also just people who have a passion for interior design who might not even be in the market for it. So that really serves two purposes for us. What one is, it does drive brand awareness for us. 
but it does that dual role just performance media and Google Shopping does. That's something that people forget as well, that you're only paying for a conversion, but that editorial content is up there. I mean, you might be in a list of four different brands who have exceptional lounge quality, but you're also driving awareness. That's exactly it. And that's being able to do that job. That one, those two jobs with the one dollar. Well, actually, the awareness is free. Yes, true. The, the, that's a good way of putting it. The awareness, <laughs> the awareness is, free. is absolutely free Correct. and unlimited. Correct. Yes, um, <laughs> it's the conversion that you only pay for. Yeah, and then look, and then obviously we have our sort of more promotionally driven stuff, cashback offers, which they work really well for us. And when we do it, we apply a similar sort of methodology to what we did do with other promotions. If we've got a compelling offer, we make sure we push that really hard. We want to be prominent on the various websites. We want to be prominent in the EDMs and we want an offer that's actually going to get people to take the leap and give us a go. Mm -hmm. And so we take it from there. So it's something that we dipped our toe into the water. We were late to the party. It's probably 14 months ago, 14, Mm -hmm. 15 months ago. And the general theory within our business is we're often giving anything a go from a marketing perspective. We run trials galore. We make sure that we've got clear measurements around them. That's one of the key things. And then uh, the final part of it is being prepared to admit when something works and something doesn't work. And mm. in the case of um, affiliate, it works. it works. So we do more of it and it still continues to return to our I business. Mean, again, you're only, you're only paying for what you get. Very yeah. Derek, minimal. our founder, uh, he's an accountant. Oh, he would love this he, then. He loves, <laughs> loves this conversation. <laughs> he rolls his eyes when I say anything about brand. But, but when we're talking about marketing channels where you only pay for when you make a sale oh that's music to an account- music, music to an accountant's yeah. ears and so how do you manage that within the business and with some of the other activity that you're activating is it all managed within the one team do you separate the affiliate marketing in its own little bucket um, everybody wears more than one hat um you know sometimes that's a hard position to justify when markets are shooting up but when things are getting a bit harder like at the moment it's good to be in a position in an organisation where we've taken that sort of leaner approach. Yep. So our affiliate program sits in with sort of our performance media team. I say team. There's two yep. of them. Um, <laughs> I guess two people does make a team. It does. Um, but that's where it sits. Mm. And along with CRM, so you've got all the data-driven activity sitting with the one group of people and they can keep an eye on all of it. As far as I'm concerned... You know, the, the competency that makes a really good performance media person, makes a great affiliate person, makes a great CRM It's a person. mindset. It is very much a mindset. It it's is, not it a is channel, all, it's a mindset. It, it is all numbers. It is all numbers. Yeah. So. You've got to have that kind of real passion and desire to see yeah. those numbers improve, to see those sales come in and Correct. to optimise off the back of that. Yeah, you don't look, just turn it on and let it run. That, that's it. That, look, and this is completely different to my mindset and that's why I appreciate the team so much is their level of detail that they go to and those ongoing little refinements. Yes. You know, I struggle to concentrate on anything for more than 10 minutes, yet Anna and James sit there and they don't leave any stone unturned when it comes to driving that program along. Yeah, look, I mean, the, the there is a lack of talent in the industry from a performance perspective. Yeah. So when you find good people who have that natural brain power and that obsessiveness, yeah. keep them. Yeah, look, I- I agree. Particularly, I think it's one of the challenges with the more data-driven areas is we're really fortunate that we've got two people who can understand the commercial side of the business, obviously translate that into our performance media. And then quite frankly, for me, the rarest part of that skill set and the one that both of them have is being able to communicate that back to the non-digital marketers Mm. within the business. Because there's a risk that it's ends up as this black box and yeah they just do some stuff other people don't understand it's undervalued because people don't understand and if they're not good at communicating it it's no one will ever understand it's just the guys sitting in the corner who just beaver away on on that stuff whereas they they play a really big role in broader discussions within our company one last question on this i was just curious to understand because you said from an affiliate perspective you're doing a lot of testing and learning mm-hmm. and that's part and it should be part of the iteration right it yep. takes time it's a bit like other channels like seo where you kind of got to build on it and yep. grow and then yes. you know you find out what works and what doesn't so what's worked and what hasn't oh really good question now i don't want to say who they are because our competitors aren't on there as much as what we are but Finding the right environments and the right affiliates to work with has been really critical. Some just boom, others don't. Uh, We don't necessarily always understand why. 
but a lot of it just comes back to the audience. You know, but if you're talking the furniture market, some of those environments we're reaching people who would might be a fantastic furniture shopper, but just yeah. a different price point. So making sure that we just keep experimenting with different individuals. And that's from a publisher perspective? Yeah. Yeah, yeah specifically, yeah. 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 The other is just around we're talking the more transactional, more promotional stuff. Just at what level we know it triggers a purchase. There's a certain amount of what's the magic percentage? If we offer a 2% cash back, is that going to drive somebody to buy a $2,500 sofa? Mm. I can tell you from experience, no. Mm. So often that we need to be a bit more aggressive with those offers. Now, without getting too boring and retail you've also got to consider that in the context of the wider offers within what is the product what is the margin on that product what is the promotional pricing on that product and then over the top of that what is the sort of the cash back that we're prepared to offer through our affiliate partners how much am i willing to give up to make a sale correct furniture is not a huge margin game um it might sound on the surface like it is but it's not it sounds like you're pricing this in a way that's making it more accessible Correct. can have quality at an affordable price and so that often means you're you're cutting your margin to be able to deliver that Correct. whereas as we know some are yeah, quality yeah, look, there's a little bit more of a price tag to that I don't think I could have put that, put that better <laughs> particularly in the environment at the moment costs are going up costs have been really high the shipping cost situation so it's a lot of businesses have taken a huge hit to the bottom line mm. so while it might sound like a discussion between two and five percent, which you go, oh, it's only three percent. What? That's not that big a deal. Actually, once you work through the entire P and L, three percent can be the difference between making money and being busy idiots. Yeah, fair enough. I'm sure it's a good tactical tool, though, when you've got those moments, warehouse clearances and the like, to just shift product because you've got a whole new load coming in. And yeah, and, yeah, 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 absolutely. There's lots of space taken up in warehouses. Um, you know, you picture how much space twenty couches takes up. It's a lot it's of space. So, so if you need to clear something out, it's really useful for doing things like that. Sam, well, thank you, thank you so much for joining us. Really appreciate it. Perfect, appreciate it. Huge thanks to Sam for taking the time to join me in the studio for his very first podcast. We have another exciting episode coming up. Here's a sneak peek. One of the biggest things that we're seeing come out of the US especially is celebrities or influencers partnering with brands like the Jenners have just done with um, the teeth whitening or with the, um, I think it's another makeup brand where Mm. they don't own the brand and all they're doing for is becoming a brand ambassador, creating their own store that the brand dropships for them. For us, how it would work would be, say, Miranda Kerr created a vintage clothing store and that would be powered by Azura Reborn. Mm. So Azura Reborn would list all the products on the store and Miranda Kerr would go out there and talk about it and promote it to her followers. Fascinating. Um, and we would basically be the back end behind mm. it and, and doing that. And we're finding there's a lot of companies popping up that are doing that through mm. affiliate marketing. If you aren't already, don't forget to follow so you don't miss an app. And while you're there, why not drop us a rating and review? We'd love to hear what you think. Flex Your Hustle is made possible by the great team at Commission Factory and produced by Ample. I'm Michelle Lomas. Keep hustling and bye for now. Commission Factory.